All right, timer is up. If you'd like okay. to go ahead and get started. Let's do that. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, Shurjo Sen. Uh, I'm a program officer with the National Human Genome Research Institute. Uh, I am very, very excited to tell you about a funding opportunity that we created and are getting uh, substantial interest in based upon applications for the first round. And uh, I hope to be able to convince many of you to be apply uh, to apply for the upcoming receipt date on the 10th of June. Uh, a few things, uh, you are able to unmute yourselves and talk if you have questions. This is extremely informal, so feel free to raise your hand or just speak up or type your question in the chat. And either Sarah or myself will make sure we catch uh, your question and make sure we answer it. I hope to be able to finish presenting in something like 15, 20 minutes. So we should have a block of time set aside for just uh, answering any questions you have while you're here. And uh, with that, uh, let's actually go ahead. Um, so today we are talking about RFA AG 23002. Uh, and that has a long title, Broadening Opportunities for Computational Genomics and Data Science Education. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background for why we are, are trying to get you interested in this funding opportunity. Um, so, of course, the part of NIH that I work for is the National Human Genome Research Institute. Uh, here at NA or NHGRI, to give it a short form, we uh, fund the science of genomics. But genomics uh, these days is so data intensive that it is hard to teach genomics without teaching some level of data science. What we have learned from engaging small institutions, uh, diverse institutions across the last two, three years is that there are substantial barriers to teaching these topics uh, at many small campuses. Among these are a lack of access to computational resources, uh, the sorts of data sets that students would feel excited by, uh, as well as sometimes the lack of expertise in both topics, genomics and data science, among individual faculty members. So we are working on the hypothesis that cloud computing, which many of you have heard of, is a tool that will enable many of these barriers to be crossed. Uh, the particular characteristics of the cloud that make it amenable to helping small and diverse institutions be part of genomic data science is that the cloud democratizes access uh, to computing resources. You do not need your institution to have a large expensive computer. You can rent uh, something from Amazon for cents or maybe dollars if you want to teach uh, computing in a classroom. Uh, the cloud enables sharing of data sets. So let's say you find a data set from a plant that is of interest to students in your part of the US and it happened to be on someone else's cloud. It's much easier to use that as a classroom tool than having to download it and wait for days while it comes onto your institution's computers. And then uh, of course, more than many other things, uh, cloud computing is a wonderful way for people to collaborate and teach together. You don't even have to be on the same campus. You could design a course with people from the other side of the country and uh, all your students could actually take part in data analysis together using uh, cloud computing as a virtual lab of sorts. So we are using the cloud and I'll talk more about uh, specific clouds such as NAGRI's Anvil and the All of Us Researcher Workbench to fund uh, two groups of uh, awardees. The first is what we call a hub, uh, and I'll talk more about that. That is a community organizer for these educational topics. And then of course, today with all of you, uh, I'm trying to uh, generate interest in the funding opportunity for partner sites. So these would be individual faculty members like yourselves who would join the hub, uh, be members of the community. And together, this would form uh, what I think we call a community of practice in teaching genomic data science in the small and diverse classrooms across the nation. So let me quickly cover the hub. The hub is an award that we funded about a year ago. Uh, as I mentioned, this awardee, and that's North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, uh, one of the nation's largest HBCUs. Uh, the award is to be a facilitator and a coordinator, or in some ways, a community organizer, talking to MSI faculty across the nation, asking what are your challenges? Uh, you know, how can we help teach uh, data science and genomics in your classrooms, hosting seminars? Uh, if your students have heard about the cloud but not used it, uh, the hub will help uh, provide some sort of hands-on cloud use experience. 
and really, among other things, help train faculty members uh, to teach these topics if their backgrounds are just a little removed. Imagine a biology professor who wants to teach genomics or a computer science professor who wants to teach uh, bioinformatics. The Hub Award would help get uh, the correct educational material into the hands of these faculty members. Uh, I strongly encourage all of you to reach out and connect with them. Literally, this awardee, uh, that, that Grads4C is the name uh, on the awardee site. The website is up on the top. Uh, Dr. Kristen Reinhardt and Dr. Joseph Graves are the lead PI and the director of the Grads4C hub. And they, I am pretty sure, would be ex just as excited as I am to connect with you and hear about the challenges you face and what would make it easier for you to teach uh, genomic data science in your classrooms. So uh, once again, just, uh, just a message that the hub has been established and is ready to help you. And please reach out to them. And uh, I'm happy to make the introduction as well, if that helps. So of course, for today, we will talk not about the hub, but about the sites. Uh, the sites is a partner of the hub in, in this community building exercise. The mission of the sites funding announcement, that's the one that uh, the upcoming June 10th receipt date is for, is to support faculty like you, uh, faculty who have uh, who teach at institutions that have a historical mission to help uh, students from underrepresented populations. And NIH has uh, specific definitions for what constitutes uh, underrepresented populations, but I'm also happy to answer uh, what that is if you have any specific questions. So this is uh, designed to help faculty at these institutions teach these topics as the awardees themselves. You would be sup supported for salary time, uh, time to build content, uh, money for cloud computing, and design things that you would take to your classrooms as ways to teach uh, genomic data science in your unique setting. The topics are computational genomics, uh, data science. Those could be separate. You could uh, propose to teach something that has genomics. You could propose to teach something that is data science uh, as a standalone topic, uh, some combination of these. And for this round of applications, the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute of Drug Abuse are both partners with NHGRI. So you uh, something that teaches cancer data science or the data science of addiction or genomics of addiction, these would also be uh, perfectly suited to the June 10th application date. And as I'll describe, we want this to be not just about you, the faculty, but also about your students. So built into the site's funding announcement, we have a way for your students to receive uh, $50,000 uh, pots of money to, for you to work with your students to design research projects where they would conduct the research and the data would be analyzed on the cloud with the hub uh, providing help and support for that exercise. So let's talk a little bit about exactly what this is about. Uh, this is limited to undergraduate and master's degree levels. Uh, we try not to do too many things at the same time and include PhDs in scope here. Plus, uh, we've learned that most small institutions are working primarily with undergraduates and masters. Uh, the curricula that we are looking for would include traditional classroom courses as well as hands-on labs. Uh, in this case, the lab would be on a cloud platform. Uh, NHGRI has the Anvil platform and a bunch of other NIH institutes have their own clouds. Think of these as being sort of uh, computer labs for hire. And all of these clouds have individual users outreach and support teams that would help uh, anyone getting an award through this to help use Anvil as a classroom tool. Uh, once again, the student research projects are a big part of this. We have learned that students connect uh, best to a teaching exercise when they feel like they were invested in it. The money uh, that I mentioned is six $50,000 pots that the hub would provide uh, individual sites applicants uh, for two-year student research projects that would be literally done by the students at these small institutions that I talk about. Uh, there is a big focus on sharing anything that you build through this. We would hope that you share so that others uh, who want to teach similar topics are able to log on to the cloud, access your material, and use it in their classrooms. Uh, that way we get a bigger return on investment. And of course, these are three-year awards uh, that are being supported by NHGRI, but also by NCI and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So I hope that gives you some sort of uh, background as to what the work is that is being solicited uh, through this funding opportunity. 
Uh, I want to talk a little bit about eligibility this uh, for the first round of applications, which was in October of last year. Most of the questions we got were on this topic. This funding opportunity is targeted very specifically for institutions that traditionally have not been applicants for NIH funding. And we have a mix of three uh, criteria here. Uh, those all have to be met. So if you feel your institution meets one of these, but not the other two, we have other funding opportunities that would be applicable, but for this particular one, you probably want to check with your sponsored program office if they have, uh, if the location has received more than $25 million of uh, R01 research funding. Uh, that sometimes happens. We have a couple of applicants in the first round who meet that number, but others, uh, for the most part, we did connect with the small places that would not have been funded at that level. The second one is the easy one. Uh, your institution has to be awarding undergraduate or masters or associates. I should actually have in included the word associates here. So if you are at a community college, this is very much in scope for you. Uh, it's just that this opportunity is not for doctoral programs. It's undergraduates, masters or associates degree programs. The third one is the one that we have been emphasizing the most. Look at the historical mission of your college and see if it was either defined as having a mission to serve students from uh, any sort of minority background, or you could use the statistics of your student body to say that we are enrolling up to 70% or 50% or some large percentage of minority students. I'm happy to answer questions, but the general theme here is that this would not be for an institution where we see just a small percentage of students from disadvantaged or minority backgrounds, even if it meets the first two bullets on this slide. So take a bit of time to read through this. Uh, me or other program officers from NCI and NIDA can help answer specific questions. And also I hope to save enough time on this webinar to help answer uh, if you know something about the student background at your location and whether it would qualify. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what would be funded through this. Uh, as I mentioned, this opportunity is to fund the creation of educational content. We take a broad definition of educational content. This could be classroom courses. This could be uh, virtual labs. This could be uh, hands-on cloud use in a classroom setting where your students are in the classroom, but they're logging onto a cloud computing platform and doing data analysis on there. So pretty much think of anything that is teaching content and it does not have to be all PowerPoint slides and lectures and traditionally graded exams. So you have substantial latitude in, de in designing something the way you want to teach it. A few things are not responsive or, or in, to use non-NIH terms, a few things would not be covered under this. Uh, this is not for just teaching genomics. This has a data science aspect to it. Uh, so even if you're teaching genomics, it has to be the computational aspects of genomics. Uh, there are There is a strong requirement that the cloud be some major part of what you plan on using. So if you were planning to teach, but using software that students would download to their laptops or something that would be on your institutional computers, that is not responsive. We are looking for people who propose how the cloud could help uh, as a tool for their students with, with help from the hub and help from the NIH cloud. So if you haven't used the cloud before, that alone is not a barrier. We will help you do it. We want you to propose how you would do it, or we can help you build an idea for that. And then a few other things, I, I won't read through that list, but uh, we will. this webinar will be recorded. And if you want this slide, I'm happy to share it by email right after this webinar. Let me know if you have any questions about the responsive and non-responsive applications. Uh, I want to cover a little bit about that student research project. We are very excited about this part of the funding opportunity. That, as I mentioned, is $50,000 uh, for two years of research that would be done by students. The money would come to you, not from NIH directly, but through the hub that I mentioned at uh, North Carolina Ag and Tech. They have the money to for you to apply and through a selective process for up to six applicants from the sites to get these $50,000 student research uh, funds once the money comes to your location, it is yours. You and your students would design the project. You would conduct it. You would collect the data. 
And then either the hub or these cloud platforms can help analyze it or ha can help help you design the part of the exercise that would be getting from the data collection into some sort of findings. So what we want from you is really ideas for how you would use this money if you applied to the hub and it was awarded and how your students would use a cloud platform and get to know how to do genomics uh, in a cloud computing setting. Uh, the reviewers will be looking for people that it doesn't have to be completely fleshed out, but at least some preliminary thoughts on what you would do uh, with a $50,000 student project uh, award at your location. Uh, I want to once again point out that this is not just the National Human Genome Research Institute uh, participating. We have uh, the National Cancer Institute. Uh, we have the National Institute for Drug Abuse. What this means is that if you want to teach genomics, but in a disease setting, you want to teach genomics, but with cancer as the disease that the genome is affecting, or if you want to teach something that is data science about uh, people that have an addiction in a particular setting, that sort of teaching content is also very, very responsive to this June 10th receipt date. Uh, my colleagues at NCI and NIDA are just as excited as I am about uh, extending these opportunities to students at small institutions. Uh, so once again, there are two other people except me who can answer those questions. If you plan on applying to either of these two tracks, uh, just let me know and I will connect you to them. Okay, so let's get into the application process. If you have any questions at all, or if you're just wondering whether this is for you, uh, reach out to me. I am happy to get on a Zoom call as soon as possible. There's a month and 10 days left, which is usually enough time to write up something. This is a small application that uh, wouldn't take six months, unlike an R01. But do get in touch with me. Uh, the sooner, the better. And I can help you determine if what you have in mind would be a good fit for this one. The SF-424 form is an NIH uh, form which walks you through what you need to apply. Uh, we have learned that many applicants to the first round uh, have not applied to NIH before, which is exactly what we wanted. Uh, the SF-424 gives you literal step-by-step -step guidance as to how to format an application. And your sponsored research offices will usually uh, know how to walk you through that. The main body of the application is part of that. It's a structured document. Uh, and do read the funding announcement a couple of times. Sometimes uh, things can seem confusing, but either I can answer questions or maybe reading it uh, two times will help make certain things clear. The bulk of the application is what we call a research education program plan. Uh, this has five components. You would describe what courses you want to create. You would describe how these courses would make use of the cloud as a new tool in the classroom. Uh, you would describe how you would share anything uh, that came out of this and how other people that are not in your department or your college would be uh, able to download, not download is the wrong word here, would be able to access and use things that you're building. And then once again, as I mentioned, uh, we want to see what your thoughts are on how to use those opportunity funds for student research projects. And finally, there's a requirement to put these things in some sort of timeline as to how you would do them over the course of the three years. Uh, a few things, uh, the application does require a specific plan for resource sharing. So make sure you have that. A couple of applicants in the first round missed that. We had a chance to have them included before review, but it always works better if you remember to put it in the first time. It does have uh, separate documents for how you would apply to the $50,000 research funds and how you would disseminate uh, the work that you do. And uh, letters of support are always important. Uh, they put the weight of your institution behind you and uh, the reviewers know that this is something that the department feels uh, positively about as well as you, the individual applicant. Uh, a little bit about review. What happens after you apply is that NHGRI convenes a review panel that's uh, fellow faculty members like you who do the initial review and provide priority scores. Uh, these scores are taken to NHGRI's advisory council where we propose a funding plan. Usually we go by score order. So we'll propose to fund maybe the top four, the top three, based on how much money we have on any given year. And then council usually puts it back in our hands saying, that sounds good. Uh, go ahead and fund these unless you have restrictions based on money running out or a particular application was missing a plan for how it would, it would disseminate its findings. 
So really there's three levels of review, but for today, all you want to uh, remember is that we have been very, very lucky to find reviewers who like many of you have taught at small and diverse institutions themselves and are finely attuned and responsive to the challenges and the situational hurdles that many of you face uh, in smaller institutions. Th these are not people at big fancy universities that will be uh, looking for massive funding from the department, for example. So let's talk deadlines. Uh, the letter of intent is completely optional. Uh, it is uh, something that if you want to send could be as simple as an email saying, Dr. Sen, I was at the webinar. I intend to apply. Three lines and that counts as a letter of intent. Even if you don't send that, you can still apply. This is completely optional. If you missed the original date for the first round, that's fine. This is a very loosely administered tool that basically just helps me get a sense of how many applications we might have coming in. And sometimes people send a letter of intent and they decide not to apply. And other times it's the other way around. So don't give that too much thought. Uh, you could choose not to do it at all. Uh, between now and the deadline, we have five weeks. I dare say that five weeks is enough time to write a UE5 application because we have made this one very small and compact in terms of NIH applications. We have not included requirements to do additional documents or additional plans that make this uh, more time consuming to write. We know and we hope that many people who have not applied to NIH before will take this opportunity. So we have kept it as small of a writing requirement as possible. Uh, with that being said, most institutions have internal deadlines for uh, maybe a week before June 10th, your college would need the application so that the sponsored uh, research office can submit it. That of course varies by location. So let's assume that there's something like a month left between today and the due date. And I feel that a month is uh, enough time to put a UE5 proposal together. And of course, me and others at NIH are happy to help. Uh, with that, I will stop. I will be happy to take questions. I'll stop sharing slides so we can see each other. Remember, you can choose to unmute yourself and just speak up, or you can type your question into the Q&A uh, on Zoom. like we have a question asking, on average, how many undergraduate students in total can be engaged in research projects in three years of this program? Yeah, that's a really good question, Srikant. Uh, it sort of boils down to what you would fit into the $50,000. Uh, we at NIH, we try not to be too restrictive in what you can do. If you propose to collect two samples per student. Let's say every student samples their back. I'm building an experiment on the fly here, but a soil microbiome project where a student samples the street on which they live and then their own backyard. So there's two samples per project, sequencing cost of $300 per sample. Now you tell me how many students you have and how that would scale with the 50,000, right? It, uh, yeah. I really think I, I've learned that undergraduate classrooms go all the way from tens and twenties of students to many hundreds. It's to some extent a question of you deciding to what, ex how much money you want to allocate each student and then matching that by the number of students. Of course, setting some money aside for cloud computing costs, some money aside for supplies, uh, and it's not just the sequencing money alone. So I'm happy to provide you know, additional input on what we've seen in the past, but uh, the answer to that is it might depend on the institution and whether a class usually has 100 people sign up for it or 20 people. And that would sort of affect how the experiment gets designed. Does that give you what you were looking for, Srikanth, more or less? Or did I miss the question completely? Okay, just email me offline, we'll take it from there. Uh, Dr. Gehring, nice to see you here. Um, I am reading your question, can Opportunity Fund support tuition? No, that, that's, uh, that's one of the restrictions we have here. These are research funds. So these would be for, um, for, the, for the actual project that they would conduct themselves.
Okay, I'm. If any of you have anything else, let me know. I'll stay on the Zoom. Uh, oh, we see another one here. Can a major university partner with the university that meets the UNC partner with another smaller HBCU? That is a fascinating question. We've had that one before. The answer to that would be if the structure of the application reflects that the bulk of the work is being done at the smaller HBCU, I think that would go down well. But if the structure of the application reflects, for example, the HBCU students actually go take classes at UNC, I feel the reviewers and of course myself would say this is not the sort of, uh, app. we designed this so that the small institution itself is the owner of not just the award, but also the work and the intellectual uh, hub of activity. So I have seen one or two applications where the larger partner comes in. It just needs to be very carefully written up so that it doesn't appear that the students are not getting the full ability to do what they want in their own home institutions. Okay. Great, thank you. We have another question about um, recommended PI effort and kind of the minimums and maximums there. Yeah, I, I'm i going to go back to the funding announcement and get the exact answer, but I think we set a minimum on it. We do want this to be, um, to some extent, something that the applicant PI is uh, putting a block of their time on, and we know it matters strongly to them. So we did set a minimum on the PI effort. Uh, please reach out to me or, or we'll look at the funding announcement if we have time on this call, but there is a hard minimum on it. I do remember that. Great, thank you. The next question is, if our proposal is meant for a broader audience of undergraduate or master's students from many institutes, as opposed to a specific student group from a singular institute or lab, would that still be suitable? As long as those students were all from the similar types of institutions that we seek to reach. So there, by the very nature of the cloud, something that gets built and distributed through the cloud would by definition be available to a broader audience. So the question here is if you have something in mind which is reaching five HBCUs within a hundred miles of each other, instead of just one, I feel that would be fine. But if this is something that is, we will build this and put it on the web and any institution, regardless of whether they have $50 million of funding or 2 million are able to use this. Then it needs to be some plan for making sure that the content is specifically tailored towards students who otherwise maybe uh, would not be receiving the chance to be part of genomics and data science. Okay, Srikant, I see something else. Another question, cap for asking cloud from this. There is, there's no cap per se. The only cap is $50,000. Uh, my feeling is that in work we've done with genomics in the cloud, the cloud when used as a classroom tool typically needs five ten dollars per student for an exercise so i have a hunch that the cloud costs will end up being a very small part of the 50k but we did not set a cap if for example you were to design something which is for advanced master students who want to do some really high throughput uh, computing on genomics data it could end up being 10 to 20k but we are not capping it. Remember, the reviewers will look at the budget and say, is the cloud costs uh, proportionate to what they have in mind? I, I wouldn't advise making it uh, you know, anything close to one third of the 50K, for example. Okay, Dr. Gering is a high-risk research project, disadvantage provided. No, I see. I see. The reviewers are reviewers. I, I couldn't comment on what individual reviewers would feel, but we did not write in something that uh, makes a high risk project not in scope. It might be worthwhile to think about whether the faculty or mentor expertise to do high risk research is available in that setting. If it is, and if it can be justified, there's absolutely no reason to not propose a student project. The sorts of things that I would be a little cautious about are collecting human samples. Usually in student research projects, a collection of human samples 
ends up uh, generating the question of was an IRB constituted? Uh, you know, was this cleared by the institution? So I, I wouldn't advise doing high risk human subjects research in the context of undergraduate or master's uh, student projects. But if it's high risk from a scientific perspective, uh, I see absolutely no reason why that should could not be done. Okay, I hope this was useful. I am, my email is, uh, set up, is there a way for us to put that in the chat or somewhere? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah. And uh, like I said, it really is the fun part of my job to talk to faculty members and answer questions about possible applications. So feel free to reach out to me. And uh, like I said, do not worry too much about the letter of intent. If you haven't done that, you can just send me an email and you don't even have to send me an email. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll hang out, we'll hang around for another couple of minutes just in case any questions haven't gotten answered. But uh, like I said, you know where to find me otherwise. Thank you, Dr. Gering. It's a pleasure to answer your questions. Okay, awesome. Let's close this down. Uh, Dr. Zhang, Dr. Chaudhary, Srikant, nice to see you. Uh, let me know if you want to get on another Zoom call. Um, and Dr. Chaudhary, I believe I owe you an annotated version of the reviews from last time. I'll try to get that done over the weekend. Okay, okay awesome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Carolyn, I see... Oh, did that get answered? Uh, yeah, we will be recording... This webinar, it will be up on the website in a few days. So people should have that. Okay, awesome. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, all.